Now, either you planned that or you didn't, but that was perfect timing. I thought only you were going to see that. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) You should know know by now I bring it back to video, like with a couple seconds to go on that, that drum beat. So good afternoon, Mr. Palmer. How are you, sir? I'm good. I was doing that for you, man. This is all all for you. But you know what? Everybody needs a little bit of fun and happiness in their life. So we're going to share a little bit of Palmer with everybody. Um, Cause why not? Well, cause once you've had a little bit of Palmer, you realize why you don't want it. So. Uh huh. Well, I'm not touching that one. <laughs> this is a PG podcast. This is not a mental health podcast or anything else. Otherwise inappropriate for work. I think <laughs> on that note, how are you, sir? <laughs> Doing bad. I never doing, doing bad. bad. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that was a Freudian slip, wasn't it? Um, mm-hmm. No, not not too bad. Um, I'm. I spent last week in uh, in the labs, so maybe that's that's <laughs> where that came. From. Were they experimenting on you? Show me on the dog where they touched you. <laughs> <laughs> you know. You know. I, after some of the things I went through last week, oh boy, um, I I maybe should have been looking for the cameras and been like, <laughs> been like, is somebody somebody recording this? No, because it we was, are now. <laughs> there was there was a lot of learning going on last week, so it wouldn't surprise me if somebody recorded it and like there's some like like private video showing of of watching you know Jim bang his head on the desk coming trying soon. to figure out how to get. This. Jim has an OnlyFans. Oh, man. Oh, man. See, off the rails in under two minutes. I love it. Um, so you, you, we might as well just pivot right into it, right? So you, you mentioned this. This is mm-hmm. kind of, we don't, <laughs> for the first time in a long time, we don't actually have a concrete topic. We cooked this up, you know, back of the napkin math kind of stuff. You went to Pistoria, home of our labs, last week. Yes. And yes. And you did some six gigahertz testing. Which yes. is why I'm going to say, let's talk about six. That's my title. I'm going to chop that out. I'm not going to laugh. We're just totally off the rails today. So six gigahertz, as we know and love, is going to be the bane of our existence, the benefit, the the glory, whatever you want to call it, for the next foreseeable future, really. It's hard to put a, a time frame on it considering Wi-Fi is 25 years old. But we know we've got a lot of work to do. We know we've got a lot left to learn, which is why you were in the lab. So what'd you learn? Well, I learned that while I went to the labs to work, you went to Las Vegas, you know, to have fun at a convention. So um, only one of us here was really working last week. Um, hey, oh, but yeah, so we've had a lot of questions about six gigahertz, right? I've had a lot of questions about six gigahertz. So there was some work that I was doing just to kind of kind of see, you know, like I, I wanted to get my hands a little dirty because I hadn't had that opportunity yet. Um you know, been doing a lot of stuff. I just haven't had that lab time that I really needed to be able to get it taken care of. And, and quite honestly, I'll be honest with you. Part of it was I didn't even have a whole lot of testing gear to test with six gigahertz. So I got most of that arranged last year, did a lot of testing, a lot of playing around. And, um, you know, I learned a lot of stuff last year about it, but I wanted to learn even more. So yeah, so yeah, last week we went into the labs and I learned some stuff. So there's going to be some document. What? I, I was going to say, I feel like to set the table, I'm teeing this up. You got, you said you had gear last year to test with, but we all know yes. that there weren't a lot of Wi-Fi 7 devices gear around last year. Well, we know that there was six gigahertz devices, right? And so mm-hmm. let's not, let's not get this confused because this is, this is actually a conversation I had last week. I actually had some SEs who traveled in to, to join me for different lengths of time This in the lab to kind of help do some of this work. And I constantly found myself reminding people that Wi-Fi 7, you know, 802.11be, is not, while it contains 6 gigahertz, it, it isn't only 6 gigahertz. So we have to make sure we keep that stuff separated. Right. So while there wasn't a lot of Wi-Fi seven stuff last year, we still had six gigahertz stuff. Um, You sent me a Google Pixel 6a to test with when I was doing my client stuff last year, which came in very handy. So thank you. Um, But then 
the end of last year, um, the Google Pixel 8 was released. And this is a Wi-Fi 7 device. So I had this. And so the other thing that I got last year was a WLAN Pi um, the community edition. That's the one that runs on the Raspberry Pi. It's got the little screen and it's got a Comfast 951 AX. It, it, yeah. It, it's sort of important. You got to open the box for it to work though, Jim. You know, I don't need lip out of you, John. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is my spare one. Well, it's my spare one because I have the I have the real one running down I here. Know, I know. Down there. Kind of those green lights down there in the corner that my hand's now blocking. Uh-huh. Yeah, see no, down there. I still see the green lights. That's my switch, but anyway, that's for the other ones. This is my spare that I needed to hold up. Right? So anyway, this will do six gigahertz, which is kind of nice because it helped me do a lot of stuff. But when I went into the labs, I was like, okay, now I have the stuff I have. APs, I have a sniffer, I have a client device, it's Wi-Fi 7. I was like, let's do some testing. Let's get some stuff going. And I learned some stuff. And there's going to be some documents we're going to write about all of our adventures in the lab. But I thought, you know what, for listeners of the podcast, I was like, well, let me bring some of this to you guys before I write the documents. So the first thing I want to talk about is this guy, the sniffer, right? So the cool thing about this is it goes into WLAN Pi and the WLAN Pi can be used as a remote sensor for using like Wi-Fi Explorer Pro and Airtool 2. That you just set them up as a remote a remote thing, right? And so when we take a look at Wi-Fi Explorer what we're going to see and if you Actually, if you're for the eagle eye person, you'll notice that I captured this um, last Thursday, April 11th at 6.50 p.m. Yes, I was working at 6.50 p.m. just for you guys. But what I want to point out is that this is actually in 6 gigahertz. And I have an SSID running on channel 5 at 20 megahertz wide. We can see all that right here. So the cool part is this lets me see an AP. And if we scroll over here to the right, you can see the mode here is AX uh, slash BE Wi-Fi 7. So this is my, my laptop. My MacBook is able to actually see six gigahertz in Wi-Fi 7, even though it doesn't have a six gigahertz radio. So score one for Jim. Now, yay. The next thing is I said, I want to do some over the air captures. So I stopped using this and I said, I want to. You had to get a little bit. It was a little late. I had to find it though. (laughs) And so cool part is this is actually the same capture. Um, that we that I loaded up in here. This is actually a saved file that I loaded up. So you save it there. I can see it in, in Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, but this is actually the PCAP, right? Over the air PCAP. Um, we can see here uh, the channel frequency 5975. So this is, in fact, part of the 6 gigahertz um, running on channel 5. We can see the beacons. Um, we can see all... All the fun stuff. And we had two devices. We were running some speed tests. We were wanting to see like how fast we could go, stuff like that. Um, all this great fun stuff, right? There was two of us. We were talking and I was sort of helping explain and teach as we were kind of going through. And so got all the pretty colors. Great stuff, right? Hey, this is what we wanted to see. And then we walked back and I stopped the capture. So anyway. Great stuff, right? This was 20 megahertz. And then I said, well, now the next step is we're going to take this from 20 megahertz wide. I want to see what happens when I go to 40 megahertz wide because um, turns out in the EU, the chances of you running a or anywhere else where you only have Uni 5, the chances of you running 
you know, an 80 megahertz wide channel is pretty low and any, and like 160, it's just not going to happen because you don't have enough spectrum there. So it's just, you know, so I wanted to start with 20s because yes, I believe there are some locations where people are actually going to be running 20 megahertz wide channels in six gigahertz because they just, they need a whole lot of channels. They have a lot of open space. The channel reuse just doesn't, you know, allow for it. I think the majority of them are going to be either 40 or 80, but I wanted to start at 20, go to 40, go to 80. So that was my progression, right? So let's go ahead and open up this file. We'll open up the next one. We're going to go to um, 40 megahertz wide right here. Now, what you might notice is there is only one color in this particular capture. It's making me hungry for some beacon. This was a 59.6 second long capture. Um, Cause that's how long it took me to start the capture. Walk across the lab to the other end, run my, run my test. And then walk back to the other side and stop it. Cause at this point in time, everybody had given up on me and gone home. So I was there late at night doing this to work. And all I got was beacon frames. There is zero data anywhere in here. So I was like, well, crap. So I went back and I looked, we're going to switch back to the one that I did earlier um, before we went to dinner. And I went down and I started looking at it and I said, okay, here we all the block acts. And so I just was like, I'll look at this next week when I'm at home, like I am right now. Um, and so I didn't really pay attention to this because when you come down here and you look at this QoS data that we see, the data rates are all six or 24. There's nothing higher than 24 on this. So while I had this, these data rates, this QoS data, there's a retry right there. This is all six and 24. And I'm like, wait a second, my speed tests were much higher than 24 megabits per second. So I was like, I got to, I mean, why are the data rates only six and 24? And that's when I finally dawned on me that, you know, my little AX, my Comfast 951 AX adapter that we were showing off before that you said, hey, you got to take it out of the wrapper and out of the box in order to use it. It's when it finally dawned on me that, hey, hey, Jim, this isn't Wi-Fi 7. So I, while I can get the, the beacon frames and all the management frames, it's because it's backwards compatible so this can read it. But the stuff that went out at Wi-Fi 7, this can't. So I can't capture it. So bad news for everybody who is you know, relying on the WLAN Pi with the Comfast 951AX or the 953. Now, and the only difference between the 951 and the 953 is the 951 um, doesn't have external antennas. It's internal. So it's a smaller form factor. Whereas the 953 has two antennas that stick out on the side. But it's the same chip, same performance, same non-Wi-Fi 7. So if you're going to do 6 gigahertz stuff, then... The Comfast 951, 953 has you covered. If you want to do Wi-Fi 7 stuff, it doesn't. <laughs> so. That now, was in a, fairness, and in fairness, they didn't advertise that they did, right? It was more of a community-driven thing. True. So this was one but, of those where I think people got excited by the, the Comfast that it would be able to, you know, hear when and, nothing else was out, right? But, and, you know, the worst part was, you know, when I actually look at, like, the timestamps on some of these, <laughs> you know, it was somewhere, it was somewhere down in, and this is actually an easy way to, um, we'll just open up one of the later ones when it finally dawned on me. Um, so yeah, so it was roughly right about this point in time, which was about 1130 PM. When I was in the lab, when I, when it finally dawned on me and I went, 
I remember Adrian saying something about this. What did he say? And I thought about it and I thought about it. And then I finally went, oh, yeah. He said, while you could see the management, you probably wouldn't be able to see the data frames because it's not Wi-Fi 7. So it was a it was a several hour process of of me banging my head on the table, which is why, you know, when you were like, you were like, oh, there's a video. They're recording Jim. I was like, yeah, they probably were going. How long is this guy going to spend trying to capture Wi-Fi 7 on, you know, on a on his Comfast 951 before he realizes you can't capture Wi-Fi 7? And it took, as you can tell from the timestamps, it took me longer than I'd like to, I'd really like to admit that I did. But the cool part is I can tell you that if we take this same file, we come back into Wireshark and if we open it up, um, so we'll take a look at the R760, um, because that's 6E and the compass works. (laughs) So, so once I, once I kind of started making sure that, Hey, I was seeing more than just, um, regular frames, you start rolling down and that's when you start seeing some of these seven twenties right here. And as you get, and as I get farther in there, you know, some eight sixty fours right there. So I'm still, I'm still chewing on all this stuff to figure out what exactly it all means to everybody. But my first lesson learned not all six um, gigahertz is you, the same. <laughs> not all six gigahertz is the same. And I'll uh I'll let everybody else in on this secret. Um if I open up these files and I spend a second looking at them, I have 20, 40, and 80 megahertz wides, and then I have 20, 40, 80 megahertz wide. Because when I shifted to 160, it didn't work. Even on 6E. So, yeah, I don't have 160 data, which kind of sucks, but need more tools. I it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, we're still, I think there's still a lot of unknowns and a lot of feeling this stuff out and trying to figure out like, Hey, what's actually happening, what's going on. And this is, this is one of them. So, you know, you can do it. You can do six gigahertz, um, six E stuff for fairly cheaper, but you know, it then makes me, it then begs the question about all the other tools we have that have been upgraded to six gigahertz. Were they upgraded to Wi-Fi seven or were they upgraded to, you know, just Wi-Fi six E and will they be able to see that, that stuff? It, 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 it makes me worried, John. I'm not going to lie. Why, why would you worry about I'm, that, Mr. Palmer? Well, because when we're going to start rolling out, because I mean, Wi-Fi seven is the, I mean, that's, that's like the, it's the first Wi-Fi protocol that was designed with six gigahertz, knowing that six gigahertz was going to be in place. Wi-Fi six, 802.11ax didn't have six gigahertz. It was just simply extended into six gigahertz. So they extended the protocol. They knew it was coming, but they were just kind of like, let's just get it to where it operate. Wi-Fi 7 is the first one that is going to have full range support for all the AP models. Um, You know, it's it's sort of that, you know, that first time that we really have the six gigahertz band that we're going to produce everything for. And I'm worried that a lot of executives, a lot of people who make a lot of decisions are going to run out and grab, you know, new phones, new devices and or laptops and are just going to be like, hey, how come this thing is again 46 gigabits per second? And as Wi-Fi professionals, we have to be able to help answer some of those questions. And as it I mean, you say that and it it reminds me back to the time and, and This was true with Wi-Fi 5 or Wi-Fi 6, I believe. Um, You know, not every Wi-Fi chip, not every Wi-Fi card is made the same. And you knew if you went and you were configuring a certain Windows laptop to avoid at all costs certain cards because the drivers were horrible. That if you wanted to achieve optimum performance for a particular vendor's hardware, and I'm not going to name the vendor, you knew to avoid a certain card because the drivers just were, were poo 
for lack of a better word. Um, so I, I think in that extent, in that instance, or in that sense, it's nothing that we're not used to doing. It just it's a whole new world of what we have to really be prepared for in terms of everything that goes into it. Because you know, and I think we talked about this on, a, on an episode maybe last year um, when you were testing clients. Or maybe we talked about it internally when you were testing clients where not every Wi-Fi 7 phone can actually do the same functions. They can't necessarily. And and it's the same thing with any other older generation devices. Not every device was capable of doing everything. Some were more capable. But now with Wi-Fi 7, not every device is standard power and low power. Not every device can do the the 320 megahertz wide channels. Your Pixel phone, I believe, can only do 160. I think my OnePlus can do 320. I'm not sure. I haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, actually, I'm pretty sure I saw it. I just didn't do a PCAP. But it, it's it's one of those where, again, where we as Wi-Fi professionals are going to have to be very, very cognizant of what we're putting into the network and what its limitations may or may not be. And that, unfortunately, includes the tools. And the reality is there's not a lot of tools out there that are Wi-Fi 7 friendly and that are also friendly for the budget. I don't think, um, I'm a little bit off my tools game, admittedly. Well, the budget is another one because I, and when I was researching this problem Thursday night, I ran across a blog for somebody who had taken the, this is a little, this is the B 200, mm -hmm. um, little chip and they put it into the WLAN Pi M four edition. That's the, that's the one that does the POE and it has the Raspberry Pi with the carrier board that can take a, you know, one of these, you know, cards, except I don't have one of those because, mm. you know, I didn't go buy it. But now it's like, oh, now I need one. But this leads us into the next topic I want to talk about for about the next 10 minutes while we wrap this up is we're looking at the data rates here. All right. And they're showing at this one, it's an 80 megahertz wide, 648. Now, for those wondering, the reason why is I was actually 80 feet away from the AP when I did this. Um, I had a, I had an 85 foot long hallway that I was in. It wasn't not a hallway. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> but it was it was 80 feet. I had my WLAN Pi set up about in the middle and I had my client on one end and I had my AP on the other end and it was 80 feet. I spent a lot of time making sure that my 80, you know, I had the exact, you know, I had this, some exact numbers and I was 80 feet away. So that tells me that, you know, I did some other testing and I found out that you downgrade from about 1024 qualm at about 20 feet. So if you're wanting those high speeds and it was like, hey, you almost got to be right on top of it. Well, yeah, you're looking at about 20 feet. No, <laughs> so, but I mean, again, that's nothing that you didn't really. I mean, that's that that's not that new. Part, that part we kind of that part we kind of knew and suspected, but we but, wanted it. We were. But still, 648 <laughs> at, at 80 feet is. That's decent at 80 feet. Yeah. And there's there's some other there's some other work um, that we did um, with is me and some of the other SCs that is very interesting. So stay tuned for that because um, we were really kind of playing around with this idea of kind of what we're looking at here. But this brings me to the thing that took us again, a lot longer to figure out that it probably should have. And it stems from a guide that I wrote um, earlier this year called the six gigahertz uh, design and considerations guide. Um, and it's this chart. And this chart comes from Comscope, who happens, they actually, made, I happen to think that the Comscope uh, copper cable is probably some of the better cable, or if not the best cable that you can get your hands on. Um, so, anyway, but it comes from this chart. And if you notice in this Cat 5e, this top row, you know, oh yeah, distance for one gig, 100 meters. Everybody knows that. That's a given number. Distance for 10 gig, a zero, it one doesn't support it. But this next column is what caught me, 2.5 gig. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to have a server that we could test against that was more than one gig because we were like, 
look, we know we only have two spatial stream devices and we have APs, you know, that are two or four, but we were like, but the, our client devices were limited to two spatial streams. So we said, we need at least 2.5 gig to even respectfully test this stuff. So we got a server running, it was running 2.5 gig, plugged into a switch that was, it was an ICX 7550-24ZP, which is one of my more favorite switches these days. And it was plugged into a 10 gig port, auto-negotiated to 2.5 because that's just what the server was, verified it on the switch, verified that the APs we were testing negotiated, they were all plugged into 10 gig ports and then they just auto-negotiated down to whatever, you know, whether it was a, a 10 gig NIC or a 5 gig NIC, or in the case of our R750, it was a 2.5 gig NIC. But we were, we were you know, sort of baselining all that stuff, right? We wanted to make sure that, hey, our, our cabled and our switch infrastructure was not going to be the thing that slowed us down. Mm-hmm. And we couldn't break one gigabit per second. Even when we wired it in. <laughs> well, that's interesting. <laughs> So, after a, after a lot of troubleshooting and a lot of testing and a lot of cussing and a lot of swearing and a lot of throwing stuff, I, mean, I won't lie, there was some stuff that was thrown last week. Um, turns out we had a Cat 5e jumper that was seven feet long. The rest of it was all Cat 6. So then you drop down and you go, Cat 6 at 37 meters, you know, it was good for 10 gig. But we had this one Cat 5e jumper that had snuck into our our setup. And it was actually from the switch to the patch panel. Everything else was Cat 6. So we should have been doing 10 gig at least, except, you know, we couldn't go over 2.5, but it's like, man. But I was like, I was like, Cat 5e will do 2.5. I was like, I was like, I, I know. I was like, we're good, right? No. Even though the switch and the server auto negotiated to 2.5, as soon as we put a load on it, the load cratered to one gig. So we we meticulously <laughs> traced through the entire wired network and we found the one place and we were pulling out you know jumpers and testing and doing everything. We were moving servers and we found this one cap IV jumper that I swear was seven feet long. And we took that out. We put a cat six jumper in and all of a sudden, magically our wired um, connection was testing at 2.4. It was like 2.4 and some change. So, I mean, not, it wasn't 2.5, but 2.4 and some change on a 2.5 gig link. I'll take it. I'm taking, I'm taking that every day of the week, right? Especially after we couldn't break one. <laughs> yeah. So, so those were my two lessons that I learned last week, John. Well, it's that, and we talked about this. We've talked about this a couple of times. It came up at WLPC. Cabling matters, and it it's it's obviously two. I mean, two unrelated but semi very related lessons actually. And cabling is going to matter a lot more with Wi-Fi seven moving forward. Um, well, I, I think it's, it's one of those things where, you know, we see these charts and I reference these charts and, you know, but truth be told, how long has cat five E been out forever in a day? It's been a while For, forever. In a, and so, but I think it's one of those things that, yeah, it's like it negotiated, but like we were never really using it. We didn't have a reason before six gigahertz to push forward, you know, and, and really, think, Hey, I need more than a gig. It wasn't until we got, it's the speed testing, right? And, and we've talked about this ad ad nauseum. And I said this at the conference where I was actually working last week, that the speed test is, is sort of a, it's a test we love to hate. However, if you're at least going to do the speed test internal and controlled environments to prove that you can get max theoretical throughput of, whatever your target is. If you've got a bottleneck in your test plan, if your test path or whatever you want to call it, you're never going to get that. You know, there's the reality is, you know, certain category cable doesn't support 
beyond, you know, it can't go up to 10 gig, right? 37 meters for Cat 6. Cat 6 e is fine, or 6A rather, uh, up to 100 meters for, for uh, 10 gig. But you've also got power concerns, right? The, the the jacketed cables can't do certain heat, right? They're not rated for that. So if you're putting this stuff in your walls and you're putting more power on it than it was ever designed to take, I, I mean, have a good home fire policy, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I just, there's a lot of considerations that we didn't used to grab. I mean, th- we both used to work at regular customer sites, right? We we both used to support networks. How often would it be where somebody would be like, hey, dude, I need a jumper real quick. And you're just reaching into your your drawer or your or your bucket or your box because we all had them. We all had several of them across mm-hmm. our sites. And you just grabbed the jumper. You, you eyeballed it for length. You made sure both ends had the clips on them. And that was it. You're not looking to see is this Cat 5E, is it Cat 6, is it 6A. You didn't care. You just needed connectivity. Especially for those shorter jumpers. Yeah. I was looking to see if I had, I don't have a seven footer sitting next to me, but I, yeah. yeah, but, but, and I, and I even took a step further because I made sure I took my, my cable tester, you know, to make sure that any jumper that I put in, like, I literally like had the cable tester in my pocket and it'd be like, Oh, we're going to throw this, throw this jumper in. And I'd be like, hold on, pull out my tester. I'd be like, and it was just one of the little, um, Hey, do I have a, an open or a short or mm-hmm. anything? It didn't put a load on it. Um, and so I was testing it to make sure that it was a good cable, you know, but the clips, it was the right length, but you have it, that, but I, cause I was like, I was like, it's seven feet. Yeah. I was like, I'm only looking forward to do 2.5. I was like, I know five gig or, or cat five E will do it, but it's just one of those things where it was such this. And I'm like, I'm like, duh, I'm the one who wrote the guy that <laughs> said, you know, watch out for the cable, but it took, you know, this, I'll be honest with you. This was probably two of us, not, not dedicated working on it, but sort of like working on it, coming back, you know, going to something else and and bouncing back and forth. This probably took us a day to figure out to where we could actually get a test because we were running these tests at the, for the 160 megahertz wide channels. um, And we couldn't get them. We couldn't get it to go over a gig. And we were like, what? We're like, what is going on? And we're like, we got it. was like, we have, and we were running iPerfs and Libra speed tests. I mean, we were doing, we were doing all kinds of, of crazy tests. And we were like, man, we just can't break a gig. Yeah. And it turns out we had this, a cat 5e jumper that was seven feet long. And so that was like, it's one of those things that like, I will never forget. And now when somebody calls me and they're like, and, and, and I'm like, and they go, Hey, I was running, you know, six gigahertz, 160 megahertz wide. And I couldn't really break one gig. I'm going to be like, you have a cat five E jumper somewhere in your environment. That's not a high quality cat five E or, and and even though you can shoot it and it'll pass clean, it's just not going to do it. So again, it was a, it was a, it was a very hard lesson learned for us because it took a lot of time away from me that I hadn't planned on spending on that. Um, won't do that again, though. but we won't do that again. So this is that sort of like, Hey, lesson learned to everybody else. If you're listening to this, if you're watching this and you're trying to test, you know, this six gigahertz and you try to get that speed test because uh, let's be honest, it's fun. Wait, it's it, fun it's, to run a super fast speed test. It's the, the drag racing of a bus is a real problem right now because that's what everybody wants to do. They want to throw the, the max theoretical speeds up there and show it off. And look, I'm not knocking anybody. We know while we were doing our podcast at WLPC, there was another room full of nerds that were doing that. that exactly that. And the, yeah. the reality is you want to be able to say, like, look, our gear, our APs, our phones can do this. And it looks awesome. It's eye-popping. I'm not knocking it at all. It's the same idea as going to buy a car and you're buying a car and you're buying it on the zero to 60 or the zero to 100 and you're only driving it in the city at 25 miles an hour max. Doesn't make any sense. Now we can, I mean, that can be a whole other topic and we've already talked about it a few times in in past episodes where it's nice to say that I can get 4.5 gig down on, on that AP, but most of our client devices, most of our clients don't need it. Even if the client device can do it, they don't need it. Um, However, it's important for that to throw out. Like last, my discussion last week was making sure you had an iPerf, Libra speed test, whatever, something local on the LAN as opposed to 
the WAN, or in addition to rather, because a WAN speed test for local area network troubleshooting is useless. Doesn't tell and, you a thing. And I mean, look, I actually don't have a problem with with uh, drag racing a bus. No, I mean it's look. You tried to do that, and you learned you you learned a couple of really good lessons that are valuable. I mean, my argument there was going to be for me at home. There's no point in doing a drag racing of a bus to an op- to a, a WAN speed server, speed test rather, because my link is a gig. I'm always going to no. be throttled at a gig. So I need, I need and- to re- reset up my Libra speed test server so that I can get the speeds that I want to see to prove that I can do it. But it's, it, it's, it's one of those things of, of knowing what the capability is. So when somebody says, you know, oh, I, I only got, you know, 2.4 gigabits per second to where you can say, yeah, you know what? That is as fast as that bus will go. Right. Oh, exactly. So exactly. it's, so, so understand, understanding that people are going to do it and understanding where that limit is, is important, but almost, almost as important as understanding that limit. And some would argue more important than understanding where that limit is, is knowing that you're never to your point, never going to use that limit. You're never going to hit that limit, but you know, it's, it's understanding why, you know, well, why did I not hit that limit? Well, because, you know, we drag raced on a 320 or a 160 megahertz wide channel. But, you know, when we look at the, the, the number of chat, and this was something we spent a lot of time with last week, to be honest with you, um, looking at how many channels, you know, were available in different, you know, the different uni bands, you know, and it was like, okay, when we look at, we look at places that are doing just uni five. Um, they only have three channels at 160 megahertz wide. So if you're in the EU, if you're in a different, you know, you're in Latin America, you're in APAC and you're in one of these countries that only has a uh, uni five, that 500, that first 500 megahertz chunk, you only have three hundred sixty megahertz wide channels, which means you're probably not deploying at 160. At 80 megahertz, there's six. Uh, you know, it. that's the tough channel we use, depending, right? No. But like you but said, you, then when you, 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 need to low, you need to understand where what the limitations are, what the requirements are to get certain mm-hmm. things so you know how to push it. I mean, and that's as much as cert, there are certain people in the community that like to sit there and say, like, they, they, they don't like that people call us Wi Fi engineers because we're not a real engineer. Um, because we don't have an engineering degree, although some of us do, none of us on this podcast do, but some of us do. Um, it's an engineering thing, right? You're going to advertise that it can do X, but we all know that pretty much everything out there can go beyond the published spec. It's just that they know at their certain limits that it's kind of unrealistic to expect much, uh, or stability or whatever you want to call it. Um, but no, I mean, I, I don't, I, I hope I didn't come off as dismissive of the, the drag racing of a bus. They are, we all do them when the new specs come out because we want to, I mean, look, I want to be able to sit there and say, I've got the fastest client or I've got the fastest AP. It's a, it's a measuring stick, uh, a sort of thing, but it, it, it ultimately gave you a couple important lessons that you wouldn't have learned necessarily, um, without doing it. So it, it's certainly not a wasted exercise. And most of these tests usually aren't, um, honestly, if you go into a lab test and you come out saying it was a wasted exercise, you probably didn't put it together too well because you should always go out and get something out of it. But that's me. Um, I don't have anything else to add. I'm sure you probably do, but I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit jealous. You got to go to the lab and play for a week. That was kind of, that's kind of cool. Play is a loaded word. (laughs) There was, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, there was a couple of times where there was some, there was some roaming tests that were going on. That was actually fun. That I had a really good time with. And and the worst part was I wasn't even doing the work, but they were, the people doing it were getting stuck and they would come back to me and be like, we, we saw this result. They're like, what happened? And so I just laugh and they were like, you knew this was going to happen. And I was like, well, I was like, I suspected it. I kind of knew that that I was like, I was very curious. And I even told them before they started, I said, I said, I think I know what's going to happen. I said, but I need you guys to confirm it for me. And so they, that's, that was interesting. The other thing that I'll tell you that I learned that I, I thought, and it was something you just touched on. So I, that's why I wasn't going to bring it up, but I'm going to bring it up. 
channel bandwidth is probably one of the more important factors to take into consideration when you start talking about throughput. It is uh, it, the testing that I was able to do last week with a bunch of different APs and, you know, trying to, as we were working on the, um, the cabling issue and we just got the cabling issue figured out and then working on the other APs we had that we were playing around with and changing, you know, just one little value at a time. Um, channel bandwidth is if you, if, if you didn't know it or if you didn't realize it or anything like that, channel bandwidth plays a major, huge factor in your little drag racing. So of course, keep that in mind. If, keep that in mind. If you're in, you know, if, if you're sitting there going, I mean, cause even, even if you have all 1200 megahertz, right. It's still only seven channels at low power indoor at 160 megahertz wide. Yeah. I mean, so, as, as we've said before, you have, we give give us time. We can definitely find a way to screw this up. Right. But I think but. there's enough rules in place and I think there's enough lessons learned out there that, I mean, we all know somebody, I'm not going to say it out loud, but there's going to be somebody, some vendor that's going to start shipping defaults of 160 or 320 eventually. Give it time. It'll happen. And that worries me because there is a, there is a significant difference when you start talking about 80 and 160. And I, I have to imagine 320, which is just like 160 didn't happen in five gigahertz because there's only two channels. Um, unless you have a very cordoned off, you know, walls that got a lot of attenuation, um, you're probably looking at 80. And that's going to really impact what you get out of your your network. So just keep that in mind when you when you start doing that and you start hearing the complaints from your um, executives. There's a reason for that. Yeah, I mean it's yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just... <laughs> so when do you go back? Right, it sounds like you got some more testing to do. I, I still have a whole bunch. I, I still got to take all this testing and get it written up and published. And I mean, there's, there's a lot of lessons learned that came out of last week. So, um, it's going to be a while before I go back, but, um, nice. then I got to get new tools. There so. you go. Well, it sounds like you got some work to do. It sounds like it's a good, good point in our conversation to call it a night or a day or an afternoon. Yep. All righty, sir. I appreciate right. you, uh, catching us up on some more Wi-Fi six fun and we'll see you guys yeah. on the next episode. See you guys. Hey there. Thanks for listening. If you liked our show and haven't yet done so, please like and subscribe. If you want to contact the show directly, you can email us at ruckcast at comscope.com. Jim and I both read those emails. To learn more about any Ruckus products or services that we've talked about on this or any other prior podcast, please check out our About section of the show or the show notes. And as always, thank you for listening. <laughs>